Hello everyone, I'm Jeff Hampton with the Fulgham Law Firm. Welcome to our YouTube channel. Today, I want to talk to you about how to beat an aggravated assault charge in Texas. We're gonna go over the ins and outs of the aggravated assault laws in Texas, and I'm actually gonna give you a little breakdown between the difference between assault and aggravated assault, what's a deadly weapon, what is the standard that the state of Texas has to meet in order to convict someone of this type of crime? By the way, if you wait around to the end of this video, I'll also give you a free ebook, What to Do If You Have Been Charged With a Crime in Texas. Okay, let's jump into this. Now, very quickly, let me give you a quick rundown. What's the difference between an assault charge and an aggravated assault? Well, quite simply, first of all, assault, let me give you what the, what the actual Texas law says about this. The crime of assault is when someone intentionally or knowingly causes bodily injury to another, okay? Now, what does that mean? What is bodily injury? Well, bodily injury means pain, okay? So some people say, well, yeah, but there's no visible injury. I don't see any actual bruising on them. Well, that makes for a pretty weak assault case, but it's not technically what the definition of assault says. It only has to be that someone says that they felt pain literally the ouch, okay? Now, what if they didn't feel pain? Well, then that's a lesser charge of assault by contact, okay? And that means offensive contact is what that means. So in that situation where you have intentionally or knowingly contact someone, uh, someone else and that contact was offensive, like let's say someone walks up to another person and pushes them, right? If someone pushes someone and they weren't actually injured, but they claim that they were offended, that becomes a class C misdemeanor in Texas. And it's known as assault by contact. Now there is no jail sentence for an assault by contact. It's punishable by up to a $500 fine, no jail time, but obviously you don't want any type of assault on your record. So those are worth fighting. Uh, also now what, what if there is actual injury? What if there's pain? There you elevate the charge back up to a class A misdemeanor, which is punishable by up to a year in county jail and up to a $4,000 fine. So those are some of the examples, but I want you to understand, and we kind of graded our way up. Basic assault by contact ticket, assault bodily injury, class A misdemeanor. Now we're going to move our way up to an aggravated assault deadly weapon. So the big way that you do this is you can end up charging someone with aggravated assault deadly weapon, aggravated assault serious bodily injury, or aggravated assault by threat. Okay, now we're going we're gonna to break that down here in a few minutes. Now, what's the difference between bodily injury and serious bodily injury? So we're going to talk for a few minutes about aggravated assault, serious bodily injury. So serious bodily injury means that literally an injury that creates a substantial risk of death or that causes death, serious permanent disfigurement, or a protracted loss or, or extended loss or impairment of a function of any bodily member or organ, okay? What are the examples of that? Well, let's say someone literally hits someone so hard or jam, maybe there's no weapon involved, but they grab a hold of someone, throw their head into the concrete, and it causes a permanent disfigurement to their face. That would qualify as a second degree felony of aggravated assault, serious bodily injury. Now, the use of a deadly weapon, and by the way, when I say second, second degree felony, what do I mean by that? Well, an aggravated assault deadly weapon or an aggravated assault serious bodily injury is a second degree felony punishable by anywhere between two up to 20 years in prison and up to a $10,000 fine. Now, what if a weapon's involved? If the use of a deadly weapon during an assault causes that injury to the victim, you could end up actually having there's instances where it can be increased. The range of punishment can actually be increased all the way up to a first degree felony, which is up to life in prison. Now let's talk for a few minutes. What if, here's the question I get more often. Wait a minute, how am I being charged with aggravated assault and no one was actually hurt? Let's talk for a few minutes about aggravated assault by threat. If no one was hurt, what if just you were holding a weapon? What if the weapon was just being held? What if you didn't threaten anyone? But what if the other person, is, the alleged victim, is being hypersensitive about the whole thing and all of a sudden exaggerates it and says they felt threatened? Well, can you actually be arrested for aggravated assault? Yes, you can. You can under Texas law. 
So, I mean, here's the one that I run into all the time. What if someone else is acting crazy towards you? What if, what if you're a concealed handgun license holder, right? Or what if you have a weapon on you to protect yourself? But what if you've got somebody on the other end that's acting nuts and they come charging at you and you pull out the weapon? Well, you know what's going to happen. Over and over again, what we see that takes place, the police are called, the police come out there, they find out you're the one holding the weapon. Even though you say you're doing it in self-defense, they end up taking the word of the other guy who claims he was scared to death and you end up being arrested for aggravated assault by threat. So that's, that is one of the things you have to be very careful of. I always tell people it's great to have a concealed handgun license. It's great if you concealed carry. You've just got to really be careful because you can put yourself in a situation where an officer could arrest you for aggravated assault. Now let's break this down for a second. What about another example is a road rage incident, okay? All of us driving down the road, uh, someone cuts us off. Uh, some of us have different tempers when it comes to that. Maybe some of us will quickly kind of run up next to his bumper and let him know, hey, buddy, I don't appreciate that. What if things get out of control, right? What if all things, things get out of control all of a sudden, police are called, both people are pulled over, and you're there explaining he was acting aggressive to you, but yet I've, I've seen an instance like this before where that happens. A guy gets out of his car. They're there on the side of the road about to fight it out, I guess, and then the person sitting in the car that wants nothing to do with that tries to drive around them to get away. But the officer shows up and the guy that started the whole thing, their whole road rage incident says, he almost ran over me. He literally charged at me in his car. Now you have a client who's being arrested for aggravated assault and the deadly weapon by threat supposedly was going to be the vehicle. Now, supposedly that that was what the vehicle was doing was threatening this other individual. So I've seen that happen many times before, and it really just comes down to the police if they choose to believe this other person's statement. All right, now the next point, what is a deadly weapon? How do we define what a deadly weapon is? Well, the law says that any item in its intended use that can cause serious bodily injury or death can be considered a deadly weapon. Now, we all know the most common ones. We know that there's the gun, there's a knife. There can be, I gave you the example of a car, potentially, right? But it could be anything. I could pull a pen out of my pocket right now, and if my goal was to jam somebody right in their eye, that could be used, that could be seen as a deadly weapon if its intended use was to cause that serious bodily injury or death, okay? So, now... I know you want to know what some of the defenses are. Let's talk about some of the defenses to aggravated assault charges in Texas. Now, one of the things I'm going to give you an example. One of those is what if there's a fight that takes place, but no real deadly weapon was used. I've had this argued before where a guy was a boxer and because he was a boxer, two people got into a fist fight. The other guy had his nose broken and the DA tried to claim because he was a boxer that his fists were deadly weapons. Right. We presented that to the grand jury and we'll talk about the grand jury here in a few minutes. Just because someone is able to use their fist better than someone else doesn't necessarily mean that a fist would be considered a deadly weapon. Okay, secondly, what if the statements being made by, made by the alleged victim were not credible? You have to have, your attorney needs to make sure and look at everything, not just look at what the police reports say. Were there other witnesses that were there? Do they corroborate what this alleged victim says? Here's the deal. It's human nature that when you're angry at someone and you're upset, police come, they pick a side, and in order to avoid getting arrested, the alleged victim is going to start saying things like, oh yeah, and they begin to exaggerate it even more. He really did scare me. Yeah, and all of a sudden they feed on themselves. And the next thing you know, maybe that alleged victim statement doesn't even add up in terms of its credibility, particularly when you compare it to other witness statements. All right, thirdly, what if there was no actual threat made? And here's one that we see all the time. We, have, we had a situation where someone comes up, and this goes back to the concealed carry situation. What if someone's standing there and they make a threat and they say, if you make another move, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to kill you. And then our guy, my client, pulls out his gun, doesn't threaten him, doesn't say anything, says, just pulls it out like this and, and looks at him and starts to walk back. No threats were made. He never pulled the gun and pointed it at him, never did anything specifically as a threat. That's a situation where now it becomes much more subjective. And without that threat, that objective threat, you may not be talking about a valid aggravated assault by threat. Also, the good old-fashioned defense of self-defense. What if someone else is acting in a way that is attempting to cause 
uh, serious bodily harm or death to you, and you respond by pulling your weapon and defending yourself. Well, let me just give you a little hint on this. The state of Texas must prove beyond a reasonable doubt that you did not act in self-defense in order for them to be able to overturn your self-defense claim. Okay? They have to prove a negative beyond a reasonable doubt. So if you acted in self-defense, you have a very strong argument to be able to fight against your aggravated assault charge. And then there's the other one. What if you acted in the defense of others? What if someone is threatening or charging at your, your child or your wife or, or you know, maybe your, whoever it is, a good close friend of yours? That's a situation there that if you were reasonably acting in defense of another, you have a good defense. Finally, this is, I'm just going to tell you, I'm not passing judgment on anything. I'm just telling you what I've seen. We've had instances where even a husband and a wife who were married, they start having some tumultuous times. And now one of the spouses lies on the other one. And in order to obtain immigration status or citizenship, in order to maintain a visa status as a victim of a crime, of a serious crime, they make up a crime. And we've actually represented multiple people in that situation. That's a situation where if that applies to you, that's an important point to show a motive why someone would make that up and a good defense for you. Finally, just good old fashioned, the story doesn't make any sense, right? What if the, what if the whole story doesn't make any sense and they don't line up with the alleged injuries or the gun doesn't match the description of what the person is describing it as? This is where you have to make sure you have an attorney get aggressive early in the process look at the evidence and present it to the grand jury. Let me tell you what the grand jury is for a second. If you submit your evidence to a grand jury, it is possible your case could be resolved very quickly. Now, a grand jury is a panel of 12 citizens who listen to evidence and they determine, is this even a case? Does this even need to move forward? The grand jury can do one of three things. Number one, they can keep the case as a felony. They can also lower the charge, number two, to a lesser charge maybe a lesser felony or a misdemeanor, or they can do number three, what's called a no bill. And a no bill is the equivalent of being exonerated of your assault charge, your aggravated assault charge. Now, in order to do that, you need to make sure you have an attorney that's gonna be aggressive early in the process, obtain information and evidence, present it as a packet to the grand jury, and you may be able to resolve your case quickly. Now, I've given you a lot of information here. I hope this has been some help to you. Um, if you enjoyed what you heard here today, like the video, subscribe to our YouTube channel. I also promised you if you waited around to the end of this video, I would give you a free ebook, What to Do If You Have Been Charged With a Crime in Texas. All you have to do is click the link below. We'll be happy to send it over to you. And by the way, if you'd like a free consultation, don't hesitate to contact the Fulgham Law Firm at 817-877-3030. Thanks again for joining us today on this video. We'll see you on our next video series.